Bradford, I didn't hear you. Well, you were whipping away at that letter as if your life depended on it. Well, it does. My boss wants it finished by 5 o'clock, or else. Your boss? <laughs> well, I have a hunch I won't be able to boss you around much longer. Incidentally, did you hear from that son of mine today? Just a few lines. He's cramming for his finals. Oh, don't worry. He'll make it with flying colors, as if you didn't know. Well, I like to hear it just the same. Mm. <clears throat> Jim will be thrilled. Yes, sir. Two Bradfords, one at each end. And me, right in the middle. Just a rose between two thorns. Well, you agreed we need new blood in the organization. Yes, but it's a pretty steep price to pay. Steep price? Oh, we're gaining a partner. But we'll lose the best secretary we ever had. Oh, no, we're not losing her, Rex. We're just tying her up to a lifetime contract. How about that? Has he popped a question? Uh, not yet. Uh, to use one of your own expressions, Mr. Barton, I'm waiting for a sealed bid and a firm commitment. I wouldn't be surprised if things were finalized right after graduation. Have you told him about this? No, no. I'm saving that as a surprise for his graduation party next week. I'd like for you to look over these plans, John. Uh, sure, sure. <laughs> That waistline, Roy. <laughs> I guess you're right, Briggs. <laughs> well, excuse me. I'll see you later. Sure. That's kind of Having a good time, Rex? <laughs> Wonderful, John. Say, you're fairly busting with pride tonight. <laughs> you certainly are, John. Uh, well, after all, when you have only one son, an occasion like this comes only once in a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Bob! Nice to see you again, Bob. Same here, sir. Come in here. Come in here. <laughs> this is Mrs. Barton. How do you do? Hello. Uh, Mr. Barton, my partner, Bob Connors. Bob, hello. Nice to meet you, sir. Classmate of Jim. Yeah, he's going to be an engineer, too. Oh. Are you going to settle around here, Bob? I haven't quite decided on that yet, sir. Well, stick to construction. This country's growing faster than we can pour concrete. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Take care of him, will you? Right. Sure. Thing, yeah. How about See a glass of punch? I'd like that. We're so delighted you could be with us, Pastor Goodwin. It's a pleasure for me, Mrs. Bradford. Too bad we can't get together more often. I know John's been busy. Well, you can say that again. That big construction job downstate has me hopping. Will you be able to resume on the finance committee soon? I'm going to try to be at the next meeting. Excuse me, will you? Surely. I've been waiting for that piece of parchment ever since Jim started kindergarten. Well, I'm glad everything worked out the way you wanted it to, John. Oh, don't get me wrong, Roy. I didn't force him into engineering. You always seem to have a natural bent for it. <laughs> Rex, Roy and I have just been talking about Jim. Now that he's coming into the firm, we can make some important changes. Yes, we certainly can. Now I'll be able to get away from that desk once in a while. <laughs> Rex detests paperwork. If he had his way, he'd be back in a pair of field boots, straw bossing every job. Hey, where is our guest of honor? Oh, uh... He's working on a long-range project. Looks more like close range to me. <laughs> we really should go in. Your father will be wondering what happened to his new junior partner. What is it, Jim? Alice, I'm not going into the firm with Dad. I'm going to study for the ministry. I've been wanting to tell Dad that for a long time, but I... I guess I was afraid of what it might do to him. I know he's had this dream ever since I was a kid. He used to spend hours teaching me to build things. He's gone through life convinced that I'd follow in his footsteps. I should never have let things go this far. Alice. 
Can you understand that sometimes a man must put aside everything and dedicate himself to a new life? A life to which God has called him. Well, I think I understand, but... But will your father... He's got to. He's got to realize that it wouldn't be fair to him or to me if I felt my place was in the ministry and I went into the firm just to keep peace in the family. When did you know Jim? Well, I'm not sure. It must have started while I was in the Pacific. There were times when I was very sure. And there were moments when I wasn't. But now I'm more certain than I've ever been of anything in my life. Oh, you'll be terribly upset. It would have been so much easier if you'd have told him before all this. I know. But he'd already started preparations. He's enjoying it. Are you sure you're doing the right thing, Jim? Alice, this thing's grown on me until it's too deep and too strong to ignore. I know what it'll mean. I know the changes that it'll bring. But there's one thing that doesn't have to change. <laughs> I, I remember another time, um, Jim was 10. And we gave him a dog for his birthday, and he built a reinforced concrete doghouse in the backyard with a foundation of a foot deep and walls eight inches wide. <laughs> to make matters worse, he, he built it right on the edge of the driveway. It would take a dynamite to move it. <laughs> it a traffic hazard for years. Inspiring, isn't it? I thought you'd turned in long ago. So this is when I do my best thinking. Look at it, Jim. It's asleep now. But it's alive. It has a nervous system, a life stream, brain, hidden away somewhere. Heartbeats that never stop. And it grows. It grows just like a man building new strength, renewing itself, just like our, our bodies build new tissues to replace the old ones. It's a process that never stops. I decided on another kind of work. I'm going into the ministry. You're what? I'm applying for admission to the seminary in the fall. You must be out of here. Are you serious? I've never been more serious about anything in my life. But, son, your whole life has been cut out for you. Everything you've ever done has been pointed toward engineering ever since you were a little boy. I know. But, Dad, let me tell you this. When I came back from the war, I did a lot more thinking than I'd ever done before. Oh, well, that's natural. Everyone has to readjust himself to civilian life. Well, it was more than that. I began to think about life. What it's all about. What am I here for? How can I make the best possible use of my life? So many know so little about Christ. That's why there are men who dedicate their lives to help bring others to God through the gospel. And they're builders too, not with steel and concrete, but with something far more powerful and more lasting. There's nothing wrong with steel and concrete, Jim. We can hold up our heads to any man. The Lord expects us to do the work we're best suited for. Did you ever stop to think that for every man like you with an engineering degree, 
There are thousands who don't know a slide rule from a T-square. Our modern complex civilization needs the slide rule men. It won't get very far without them. Without the others, it won't get any place. What's the matter, John? You still worrying about Jim? Well, not as much as I was last week. You know, the way I've got it figured, Rex, if he hangs around here for a couple of months, he'll be forgetting all about the seminary. Jim, would you come in here, please? If he's as good an engineer as I think he is, he'll be just dying to get his teeth into something like this. Just that? I want you to see something that's out of this world. First of its kind anywhere. Three sides faced with glass and aluminum hung right on the steel. This would be a terrific saving in weight. Not only that, we will save something like 60 days in the facing work alone. Nice recognition for any man connected with it. When do you break ground? Early in the fall. If we get the bid, that is. Mr. Barton, I have Pittsburgh on the line for you now. Thank you, Alice. I'll take the call in my office. Excuse me, John. There's another reason why you should stick to engineering. Do you think Alice is cut out to be a minister's wife? Remember, she's one girl in a million. Do you think you're being quite fair to her? Dad, I'd rather not discuss this any further. Aren't you ready for church? No, I can't go today. These specifications have to be in the first thing in the morning. With Rex out of town, the whole load is on me. But, John, surely... I know, I know, Dora, but I'll be tied up with this all day, maybe half the night, and it's have to go on this way for a long time. Will we get more competent help in the office? I'll get the car and meet you downstairs, Mom. John, you've got to stop behaving like a little boy. You've got to realize Jim's old enough to make his own decisions. I wonder. Decisions are supposed to be based on common sense. Jim's showing very little of that. John, how can you talk like that? He's told you his reasons. You know them just as well as I do. All right, all right, Dora. But I have a hunch that before the summer's over, he'll think twice before throwing his old future away. <laughs> let you throw away the rest of your life. But, Dad, if you'd only try to understand. What is there to understand? You've proven you're a born engineer. You don't have any right to throw that knowledge away for something you don't even know you're fitted for. A man his age shouldn't be losing his temper that way. I tell you it's absolutely... I was afraid this would happen. But, Dad, if you'd only Mr. Try Bradford's to tried to hide it, but what he's been brooding over it for weeks. You've proven you're it's a not going to get him anywhere. Jim's made up his own mind. I'm not going to let you throw away the rest of your life. Cheer up. A lot can happen in the next few years. It's something I have to prove to myself. Can't you understand that, Dad? No, I don't. It's just plain stubbornness. Any way you look at it, it doesn't make sense. I thought after a summer at home, you'd come to your senses. Realize how idiotic the whole thing is. Dad, I can't I help suppose it. it doesn't matter to you at all that I made plans for you all these years. Plans for you to keep the name Bradford alive. Dad, I found something more important than building bridges and skyscrapers. Okay. 
Okay, Jim, let's not argue anymore. I, I'm sorry. I lost my temper. If you're set on becoming the Reverend Bradford, give it a trial. Get it out of your system and you'll find a place here waiting for you. Thanks. I'll remember. Alice, darling, your letters are always so wonderful, like a breath of home and the voices of all my loved ones. You will never know what they mean to me. The past few months have opened up a new world to me. I'm more certain than ever that I have found my calling. Please write soon. All my love, Jim. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Bradford. Well, I see the mail came through again. Mm-hmm. Uh, come in a minute, Alice. Yes, sir. What did you have to say? Well, apparently everything's fine. So I gather. Don't ever mind your notebook, Alice. I just want to talk to you a minute. You know, uh, Ever since you and Jim had your first date, I've always had it in the back of my mind that someday you two would settle down together. Mr. Bradford, I've heard of matchmaking mothers, but never matchmaking fathers. Oh, my wife feels the same as I do. She thinks you'd make a wonderful couple. Um, Alice, I'm worried. If his letters to you have been anything like the ones I've been getting, then it's plain to both of us that he shows no signs of quitting. Well, he does seem wrapped up in his work more than ever. Yes, that's what I mean. I think it's time that we started to do something about it. We? You. I don't think he'd listen to me anymore, but I think you might be able to persuade him. I'm just sentimental enough to think that he'll listen to his heart sooner than he will to his head. But, Mr. Brad, uh, What do you think might happen if you suggested that you're not interested in becoming a minister's wife? I don't see how I could tell him anything like that. After all, he hasn't even asked me to marry him yet. But I thought you always had an understanding. Well, not exactly. At any rate, we're really not engaged. Well, just the same, I feel that he might think twice if you raised serious objections. I'm not sure that I should, Mr. Bradford. You see, I want him to do whatever will make him the happiest. Thank you, John. Good morning, Dora. Good morning, Pastor. What do you hear from Jim? Uh, nothing new. The uh, same old thing. You know, Pastor, after a whole year, John still thinks Jim will change his mind. You think so, John? Time will tell. We'll see. I've had a couple of letters from Jim, too. I think I know what time will tell. Well, John, we must be going now. Good day, Pastor. Yes, good, good morning. Seems I've been busier this semester than during my first two years. But darling, I'm really enjoying it. Naturally, one of my favorite subjects has been our correspondence course. I watch for the mail delivery every day. You'll never know what your letters have meant to me. It wasn't a bad job, Mr. Bradford. But I am looking for a new connection. Something more permanent. Something I can grow with, sir. I see. You may remember that Jim and I were in the top ten in our class when we graduated. Yes, it looked like both of you were going places. Bob, I'd like to have you with us, but I'm going to be frank with you. You know that Jim was supposed to come into the firm. Yes, yes, he mentioned it quite often. And in spite of what's happened, I still have hopes that he'll be with us. He has another year before he graduates from seminary, and by that time we should know definitely. Meantime, you, you understand my position. Well, of course, sir. And you keep in touch with us, Bob. I'll do that, sir. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank 
Boy, did I move fast when I got your call. I went right to the station from work. Of course, your dad let me off early. For all the good it did, I had to wait a whole hour for the next train. But that doesn't matter. I'm here now, and we can talk. Jim Bradford, you haven't been listening to a word I've said for the last five minutes. What's the matter with you? You seem so eager when you phoned me. Alice, I've been wondering for days how to tell you, how to ask you, ask you to marry me. But there's something I've got to tell you first. What is it? Well, a few days ago, I received my appointment. I've been assigned to foreign mission service. Foreign mission? But why? I always thought you'd be here in your, in your own church, like, well, like Pastor Goodwin. I know, I guess most of us think about it that way when we start. But I hadn't been here very long before I began to look at the whole program of the church from an altogether different angle. I began to see it as a global strategy, carrying out the command of Christ with dedicated men holding outposts in distant lands. And somehow I began to feel that God intended me to man one of those outposts. Oh, but Jim, how can you be sure? Darling, I've been thinking and praying about this almost every day. A year ago, I wasn't sure. Today, I am. New Guinea. New Guinea. You must be out of your mind. I've never heard anything so idiotic in all my life. What'd your mother say to all this? She understands. Well, I don't. And there's something terrible about taking a man with your training and sending him out to a place like that. You go where you're needed. Tell them you're not interested. But I am. What can you do for a bunch of savages like that? I'm going to try to bring them to Christ. You're qualified for bigger things. Is there anything bigger? Well, then. Uh, what about Alice? What does she say to all this? Well, she hasn't made up her mind yet. Yeah. I have a hunch she has more sense than to waste her life in a place like that. Whatever possessed you to even think of such a thing? Well, it's not easy to explain what possessed me, Dad. But once it started, I couldn't think of anything else. I mentioned the war before. That's when it began. That's when I began to see that the war we were in would never be won with bullets and bombs. As we pushed through island jungles, we came face to face with people who couldn't understand the bullets that killed and maimed, nor the bombs that ripped their homes apart. We told them we were fighting for their freedom, and we were. But freedom's hard to understand on an empty stomach. We told them we were Christians, fighting against godlessness. But in their silent faces, we read the question, what had our Christianity brought them, except suffering and destruction and death? And sometimes even I wondered, but I thanked God more than once that I'd been brought up in a Christian family. Well, one day, while we were on our way back to the front, we were having a hot discussion about religion when one G.I. in our squad blew his top. Ain't that a laugh? Now, ain't that a laugh? The whole blasted world is blowing up in our faces, and what are we doing about it? What's religion doing about it? What's the church people doing about it? Except sitting on benches and singing hymns, and then start yapping about sweetness and light. Boy, oh boy. Look how that sweetness and light is saving the world. Why, if they had half the guts of half of the guys in this outfit, they'd shut their big fat mouths and start doing something about it and quit their lousy psalm singing. No. They put a couple of bucks in the collection plates and start singing hallelujah. They're doing a lot more than you think. The trouble with you, Burr, is you're too busy shooting off your mouth to find out. Yeah? Well, what about that brotherly love they're always spouting? Maybe we could use some of that brotherly love around here. Like those kids we saw in the village living in those stinking rotten houses. Maybe they could use some of it. And those mothers crying their eyes out. And those scabby old guys dying in the streets. Maybe they ain't neighbors, is that it? Well, sure they are, but you can't expect the people in the churches to change the whole world overnight. Baloney. They've had 2,000 years to do it in. What do they got to show for it? 
And if those starch shirts who sit with their hands folded over their big fat bellies every Sunday really mean what they say about religion helping people, why don't they do something about it? Why don't they quit shining pews with the seat of their pants and get over here and get to work? Or they're afraid they'll get their pretty manicures all mussed up. If you ask me, they're all a bunch of lousy, stinking hypocrites. They're gold brickers, all of them. They ought to put up or shut up! How could I answer? How could I explain away a complacent, comfortable Christianity? I used to wake up at night with his words beating at me. I've never been able to get them out of my head. Maybe now you can understand how I've felt ever since I came back. You do think he's stubborn and, and maybe foolish. Deep down in your heart, aren't you proud of him? Mr. Barton in his office? No, sir. Oh, Mr. Connors is joining the firm, starting immediately. Nice to have you with us, Bob. Thank you. I might as well warn you that Alice is the real boss around here, and if you want to get along, stay on the good side of her. Confidentially, don't you believe a word of that boss business. <laughs> Come on, I'll show you your office. All right, sir. you long before this. Oh, I was detained at the office. Is uh, dinner just about ready? Dinner can wait. Take a look at this. Jim. Well, it's about time we had a letter. I've been so busy, I practically lost track of time, but in the evenings, my thoughts always return to my loved ones at home. I often wonder what you're doing, and sometimes, strangely, what you're having for dinner. <laughs> well, Mom, I sure miss those wonderful Swedish meatballs you used to cook for me. How about lunch today, huh? I know a nice, quiet little place where we could uh, talk about dinner for tonight. Don't you ever think of anything but food? Oh, the food's only a decoy. I see. You do all your trapping with vitamins. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's all I can afford. Well, I can't promise about dinner, but um, I always go to lunch at 12. Fine. See you then, huh? Weather holds a few more weeks, we're going to be in good shape on that Linux job. Yes, looks like that double shift idea of Bob's is paying off. Saved a lot of headaches. You know, I think he deserves some kind of bonus. Judging from the way things are going, he'll probably be able to use one. What do you mean? 
Maybe I'm wrong, but I think I've noticed a cow-eyed look every time he's around Alice. Oh, I don't think there's anything to it. Jim's been very faithful with his letters. Yes, but uh, Jim's 10,000 miles away. John, I was just glancing through those old snapshots we took, especially the ones of the lake. I can almost smell the pines. If we go this year, could we go early? Well, depends on what you call early. You remember that time we went up in May? Had frost every morning? Seems like such a long time ago. Wasn't that the year that Jim helped the beavers build their dam out back of the cottage? Yes. Nearly flooded us out when it broke. I think he realized after that he wasn't as smart as the beavers. Thought we'd have a letter from him today. Busy as he is? Can't expect a letter from him every day. Yeah, I know. Alice hasn't heard from him for several weeks either. I have a feeling that he and Alice are drifting apart. It isn't easy to keep a romance alive when you're 10,000 miles away. I always dreamed that Jim and Alice would marry. Yes, I thought so, too. She hasn't seen Jim in over a year. And she's with Bob Connors every day of the week. You really think it's possible for a girl like Alice to forget Jim so soon? Oh, I never went along with that old idea about absence making the heart grow fonder. Something inside tells me that Alice will never forget Jim. Well, in spite of your woman's intuition, I'm afraid it's turning out the way I've been suspecting all along. I don't think Bob can sweep Alice off her feet. She isn't the kind that sweeps so easily. Hello, Marion. Good morning, you lucky, lucky people. Good morning, dear. What's this about being lucky? Oh, just to be alive on such a wonderful morning in such a wonderful world. Sounds like your boss just gave you a raise. Mmm, better than that. I'm quitting. I uh, received a proposal last night. I'm getting married. Well, aren't you going to congratulate me? He's really a wonderful man. Oh, yes, I know. Of course. Of course he is. It's just that, uh, well, it, it's so sudden. Are you sure you're doing the right thing? I've never been more sure of anything. Any girl should be able to make up her mind in six years. I didn't realize you'd known him that. I'm leaving next month. For New Guinea. Oh, I'm so wonderfully happy, dear. May God bless you both. Thank Alice, you. it's just everything that I've always wanted. Oh. <laughs> Hold on, wait a minute. You said he proposed last night? Is he, is he, uh... No. It was a cablegram. I'm sure it was the shortest and most expensive proposal ever made. What did I tell you? I knew all along this was going to happen. <laughs> And this is the first picture we got from him a couple of months after he landed at his mission in New Guinea. And this is Jim and Alice on their wedding day. They said it was quite a celebration for the natives. Uh-huh. And this is a picture of their first baby when he was three months old. They named him Jim Jr. And this is a picture of little Jimmy on his second birthday. We got it in our last letter. I haven't pasted it in yet. Fine-looking boy, isn't he? I'll say he is. James W. Bradford, Jr. Every inch of Bradford, if I ever saw one. He has Alice's eyes, though. Oh, but look at those shoulders. He's going to be big, like his father. His grandfather. About a half hour ago? Thank you very much. Goodbye. Mrs. Bradford said he was coming straight to the office. Oh, I hope so. He knows this bid has to be in by 11 o'clock. No chance of postponement, huh? We might just as well forget it. Good morning. Good morning. You had us worried, John. We've got less than an hour to oh, take... Oh, yeah, I, I know. I know, Rex. I'm sorry. Uh, come here. Come here. I, I've got something to show you. Uh, it, it came in the mail this morning. First, first pictures of my new granddaughter. Uh, just, just look at that. Isn't she a beauty? Oh, she is cute. Yeah, nicknamed her Jody. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, just, just, just look how Jimmy's grown. My goodness. You know, 
I don't see any reason in the world why that young fellow shouldn't grow up to be a Cracker Jack engineer someday. Now there, look, look at that, Pastor. Li living in a shack out in the middle of nowhere. Now I ask you, is that any way to raise a family? Well, what's going to happen to those youngsters brought up with a bunch of savages? If the gospel has reached them, John, I'm sure they're savage in appearance only. But look at it from a practical standpoint. If Jim had stayed here with the firm, by now he could be earning enough to keep a dozen missionaries in the field. I dare say he could. Well, then wouldn't it be just plain common sense for him to stay home and uh, contribute his money? John, there are millions of us here at home with the means to support our missions. But only a chosen few have the qualifications and the consecration to do what Jim's doing. Ah, I still say he could do more for his church right here than he ever could in that godforsaken place. God never forsakes. That's why he called Jim to carry on his work in a distant field. Well, what is it, dear? chance of moving him from this place? Not until the fever is down. Then we'll fly him out to Madang. How soon do you think that would be? Can't say yet. Each case is different. Depends on the individual. Has to run his course. We'll call in, Alice. Can't I stay? I, I don't like the idea of leaving him alone. He won't be. My wife is a registered nurse. She will be on duty tonight. I'll wait till she arrives, Doctor. Does he make his headquarters here? No, he and his wife are stationed at the hospital at Madang. Is this where Jim works? It's his main base, but he spends a lot of time out in the native settlements. That's where he picked up the fever. when they wear out first, Copa or the wagon. They don't seem a bit nervous in front of that native. Copa's one of their favorites. A houseboy? A medical orderly and our best interpreter. He was one of Jim's first converts. Alice, I, I'm, I'm terribly worried. We've got to get Jim away from here. I've prayed that we could, but Dr. Newman insists he's in no condition to be moved. I mean, after he's well, isn't there a chance that he'll come home to stay? It would please Dad so much. I know. I used to ask myself the same question when I first came out here. I was homesick and miserable. Then when the children came, I began worrying about them and their future. I don't know, after a while you forget all about your own problems. There's so much to do. The work at the mission becomes your whole life greater than any material reward. It comes from knowing that you've brought these people to their savior. I'm sure that Jim knew when he was in the seminary that 
This was the work God wanted him to do. My fault, Jim. Should have put my foot down. Could have saved you from all this. No, Dad. I was saved a long time ago. That's why I'm here. But you've done your share. It's time you came home now. Not yet, Dad. You wouldn't walk off the job when the building was half finished. We're not even that far along. Barely laying the foundation. Anything I can do, son? Anything? Quickly. Sure, where you wanted those packed. He always kept them together. I think he felt they represented what he was trying to do. Building a house of God and bringing souls out of the darkness to worship in it.
When I asked him if I could help, if there was anything I could do, he just handed me this. Have you read it? Some of it. I'm not sure I understand. I used to think I didn't either. Then after I read it a few times, something came to me that Jim never put into words. I think that's what he wanted to tell you, too. It's a record of his work. And like his work, it's unfinished. I got it off this good for you, Amu. If it starts squeaking, put some grease on the wheels. Go fuck and show him take away cry blong wheel wheel. Come now, it's bedtime. Why well, don't it's bedtime, too? No, no, Jody. You and Jimmy gave it to Amu, remember? <laughs> night now. Say good night. Night. Night, Amu. Sit down, wheel, wheel. Say good night to Grandpa now. Yeah. Good night, Jody. Sleep tight. You too, Jimmy. We got a big day tomorrow. Do we go to sleep on the airplane when it gets dark? Yes, sir. All the comforts of home. Grandma will tuck you in, and I'll be in later to hear your prayers. I can do, Alice? No, thanks. Packing's just about finished. I didn't have any idea of all the things you did out here. Jim's letters never told half the story. Tell me frankly, Alice, wouldn't you say it's a losing game? It isn't a game. Jim always used to call it a fight. In spite of all the setbacks, he had a taste of victory. That's what kept him going. Have you noticed the record of baptisms? Yes, I saw you baptized a big class in April. Jim must have been very gratified. Sometimes I wonder. Dad, you wouldn't wonder if you knew what the gospel really means to these people. They've always lived in a, a life of misery and cruelty. Their language doesn't even have a word in it that expresses hope. And then when they learn that there's a God of mercy instead of vengeance, that in his world there's love instead of hate, and that through Christ he offers salvation and eternal happiness, to them, it's just like stepping into a brand new world. If you could see them, then you'd understand.
John. It's late. You should get some sleep. Oh, it's no use. I can't. Dear, I wish you'd stop reading Jim's diary. Always something new. Something I never understood before. I know it makes you feel closer to him, doesn't it? Very close. Here, just, just read this page. If only our people at home could be here to see the darkness disappear under the light of God's word. Those were his last words. Never had a chance to finish his work. Jim understood that God's work is never finished and that others would go on with it. Hurry and get your coat, Jimmy. All right. I've already got mine. Here, I'll help you put it on. It's so wonderful to hear children's voices in the house. It's going to be so much fun. John, it isn't good for you to brood like this. Well, it's no use. I can't forget. But you must forget. What's it like, Mommy? Oh, you'll Don't see let the you children know. see you in this mood. I'll try. I think they're just about ready. Well, come along, dear. I'm so happy, Mommy. Oh, I'll bet you are. I've never seen anything like it, the way you're going Thank out you of this coat. You haven't had it a month. Well, the climate agrees with him. He'll be ready for football before you know it. Are you going with us, Grandpa? Where are you off to today? Oh, we're going to see all the animals, lions and tigers and elephants. A circus in town? The zoo. Grandma promised to take us. Aren't you going, Grandpa? Oh, I'd like to, but I've got to go down to the office for a while. You have a good time, Jody. Scoot along, now. Don't miss anything. Don't forget to buy peanuts for the elephants. <laughs> Bye, Grandpa. Bye. Have a good time, children. We will. Maybe you should have gone, Dad. A little change might have been good for you. Oh, it isn't easy to forget the past. I know. I made myself miserable, too, trying to forget. But now... Dad, now I find something very wonderful in, in looking back. The things Jim did will never die. Knowing that, I don't want to forget. What if his work does live? Jim's dead. Why? Why was he taken away if he was doing so much good? It doesn't make sense. I don't understand it any more than you. But I know that, that Jim died doing the work that God gave him. God must have had his reasons. Sure did. I thought I was a goner. I walked to a Halloween party and scared all the kids good. I'll bet you did. Yeah, let me see that. Atta boy. Whoa! Hey, that was close. What you need, young man, is some diagonal bracing here. What's that mean? Yeah, I'll show you. Every building needs bracing, Jim. Why? Otherwise, it's like trying to stand on one foot. Another engineer in the family? can fix anything. Uh, you better get ready for bed, Jimmy, if you want Grandpa to read your story. Okay. Tell Mommy how I scared you. All right, Jim, we'll do that. Good night, huh? Good night. Well, he's, he's quite a boy, Alice. 
how are they taking to city life, huh? Oh, it's amazing how they adapt themselves. You'd think they were born here. Sure, I, I imagine before long they'll have uh, completely forgotten their life over there, huh? Yes, I suppose they will. Alice, do you think... I'm sorry I kept you waiting, Bob. It was a pleasure, sir. Uh, well, you'd uh, better set up a meeting with Rex for the first thing in the morning. I want to discuss these with both of you. All right. Well, I'm ready, Grandpa. Well, I'll be right with you. I uh, suppose you scoot out there and get the book ready, huh? Okay. Well, now the night shift goes on duty. I'll see you in the morning. Good night, sir. Good night. Uh, not a long story, Dad. It's past their bedtime. If he ever gets over his great disappointment, it'll be because of them. And as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, some fishermen were washing their nets from the sides of their boats. Two of them were brothers. Their names were Simon and Andrew. And Jesus came to them at the side of their boat. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What's that mean, Grandpa? Were they going fishing for men in the water? What? Oh, oh, yes. Um, well, you see, what Jesus meant was that the fishermen should follow him as he went from city to city, helping to bring other men to him so they could learn more about Jesus. Like what my daddy did? Yes, like your daddy did. Are the children ready yet? In a few minutes. I didn't have a chance to mention it last night. Got a letter from Gertrude Newman. Remember her, the doctor's wife? Sure. They just returned to Madang after a few weeks at the mission. She said they're facing a serious problem. You see, Dad, they haven't yet sent anyone to replace Jim. They haven't? Why not? Well, there just aren't enough workers to go around. Alice, could you help me a moment? I'll be right there. Oh. Gertrude said Cope has been running the mission practically single-handed. I better go help Mother. Indeed, these words of the Savior could well be called the overriding compulsion of his entire life. Listen to the urgency with which he speaks. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now, what was the work to which the Savior had dedicated himself so unselfishly, so unremittingly, so completely. It was the work of redeeming a lost and sinful race from the guilt, the power, and the punishment of sin. By his holy, spotless life, in our stead, by his innocent suffering and death, in our stead, he paid the ransom and won our complete release from the infernal powers of darkness. That, above all else, is what he meant when he said, I must work the works of him that sent me. And do you know what he's saying to you and me today? As my father hath sent me, even so send I you. We, too, have a divine mission here on earth. Ours is the task of proclaiming far and wide to all men everywhere the glorious news of their redemption through the life and death of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, honestly, how much are we doing to fulfill the Savior's purpose here on earth? How much are we giving of our time, our talents, our possessions, of ourselves, in order that the unfinished task which he has placed before us may be carried forward. Well, 
we sit here on Sundays. We bring our offerings. We sing our hymns of praise. But Christ did more than sing. He did more than give. He worked and bled and died in order that all men everywhere might live. If only our hearts might be touched by the warmth and fervor of his love. If only our eyes might catch the vision that was his. If only our lives might be completely dedicated to his purpose, the spreading of the gospel to the ends of the earth. If only, like him, we might hear that inner voice at the dawn of each new day which says, I must work the works of him that sent. Has Mr. Bradford come in yet, Miss Lane? No, he hasn't. Call me when he does. Yes, Mr. Barton. Hey, good morning, Miss Lane. Good morning. John. Oh, hello, Rex. How's everything? Uh, under control. Uh, I'd like to go over these Bardwell papers with you. Oh, of course. Come in. Come in. go for a while. I suppose so. What is it, John? I gotta get away for a while. Maybe for a long time, but I'm sure that since Bob's taken hold, the two of you can get along without me. Uh, you've earned a good rest. Oh, no, no, nothing like that. But I'm going to try and pick up where Jim left off. You doing missionary work? In a sense, yes. I don't get it, John. Ever since I came back, an idea has been growing in my mind like I did with my son a long time ago. Of course, we can't all be foreign missionaries like Jim. But we can do something that the church has been stressing for years. What's that? We laymen have a job to do. Recently, I attended a national meeting of the leaders of our church in Rex. I've had my eyes opened. There's a great need all over the world today, and perhaps I'm not too late to make people realize how vital it is. I'm going to do a lot of work right here at home. It's not going to be easy. Probably be the toughest job I ever tackled in my life. But it's something that would have made Jim very happy. Do oh, wish she'd hurry. Don't worry, Mrs. Bradford, there's plenty of time. That's right, Mother. Jane doesn't leave for a whole hour now. Grandma, are you going to go away with Grandpa? No, dear. Your Mommy and Bob are going to take Grandma to the station while I put you and Jody to bed. You know, I don't think I've ever seen him so excited about anything. He spent half the evening getting ready. You really go fishing, Grandpa? Fishing? Well, now, what ever put an idea like that in your little head? Mommy said you were like the men Jesus talked to in the Bible book. Oh, no, no, not quite, but uh, something like that. Here, you, you sit on Grandpa's lap and I'll try to explain. You, uh, you remember Amu, the little boy in New Guinea, the one you gave your wagon to? Well, there are lots of little boys like Amu all over the world who don't know anything about Jesus. Somebody's got to go and tell them, like your daddy did. My daddy told everybody about Jesus. Well, Jolie, I, I can't do what your daddy did. But I'm going out and tell a lot of people that the world needs the very thing your daddy did. And maybe when they know, they'll send more and more people all over the world to do what he wanted to.
attended a meeting of the leaders of our church. Day after day, they discussed the tremendous opportunities which God has placed before our church and the problems which have come to us along with those opportunities. There was one thing on which all of these men were agreed. The financial patterns which our church has followed up to now will never do. The financial patterns of the past will never do in the face of the present challenge. When I came back to my own congregation, I presented this problem to our church council and I said, brethren, what this meeting needs right here is not another resolution, but a revolution. A revolution in our financial thinking. We must rethink our entire life of Christian stewardship. We must pray, we must work, we must live our faith every minute of the day. I know that I am approaching the evening hours of my life. But whatever time and whatever energy the good Lord still gives me, I am going to dedicate myself to the building of his kingdom. If the kingdom of Christ is to be built, it is up to us to build it, you and me. It is up to us to carry on the unfinished task which he himself has left us. He gave his life for me. And I am going to go all out for him. Some time ago, I read a passage of the Bible written on the flyleaf of a missionary's diary. A passage I shall never be able to forget. I should like to leave it with you tonight. They are the words of Jesus. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can 